name is John Anthony. I work mostly as a computational biologist and general software support kind of guy at uh, a couple labs at, in the Boston College Biology Department. And uh, some of these, I've also authored a few different closure and closure script libraries that are out in uh, GitHub. Um, Cite is something that's, that came kind of uh, as a project that, uh, that we kind of I wanted to make uh, data exploration in something like Clojure or Clojure Script easier. Not, not so much simpler, it's more of an easy thing. Something literally as Rich Yuki would say, it's, it's quick to hand kind of stuff. So it kind of grew out of a, a, a series of projects actually that started in a way with uh, another library I wrote called Hanami. And um, which is really more just a straight library for creating standalone visual application oriented applications. So that was great, but it, 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 you literally have to set up a project and build things and you know, kind of your normal project kind of software development structure. But what I wanted then was something easier <laughs> where you can just fire something up and immediately start playing around with data sets and whatnot. And that's sort of where Hanami came from. I mean, Cytate came from then. Uh, and it's kind of grown more and more complete and, and more robust over the last two and a half to three years, actually. It's not something I work on full time, obviously. I mean, I have all kinds of projects that I have to do for the labs. Uh, but um, actually it's got to the point now where several things that I do for the labs are delivered via Hanami dashboards and documents and things. So it's become as a product, uh, I mean, a, pr a productive sort of environment to be quite good. Um, so, with that, let me start sharing some screens here. Um, always have a hard time with Mr. Zoom. All right, so does everybody see this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this is sort of the overview of what this talk's gonna be. It's, uh, we're gonna go through some preliminaries, which is gonna include a live install. Uh, and we're gonna talk about very general high level notions of the capabilities that, that this thing provides. Um, and we're gonna spend some time talking about the editors that it has and how the editors actually influence in many ways the capabilities um, that it provides. There's some very interesting things about this. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about keys and, and the associated functions that they can invoke. There's a bunch of defaults. All of this stuff is customizable and we'll kind of glance at both of those, both the uh, uh, functions and the associated defaults and how you can sort of, uh, and, and not sort of, how you literally can configure a bunch of different variations of this if you don't like uh, the, the standard defaults. And if you're not an Emacs user, you won't like the standard defaults. Uh, very unlikely at any rate. Um, code execution. This is very interesting because there are three modes of uh, code execution and in Saite uh, involving the different places where it gets executed. Then we're gonna talk about the control panel. I'm gonna spend a lot of time on that, but we're gonna at least talk about all this stuff up here at the top. Um, then the notion of tabs and the two particularly different tabs that are directly available in, in Saite. 
And then we're going to do some live examples. We're just going to literally jump in and start fooling around with some stuff. None of this is going to be very detailed this time around. Um, but the hope is, is that at the end of this, you'll have a pretty good idea of what this thing provides and at least a starting point of how you might be able to jump in and use the thing yourself. All right, so with that, let's go over here to the preliminaries. Actually, it's probably worth noting that this presentation itself is, is a site day document. Um, so there's a couple of different websites associated with this, one of which I already mentioned, which is Saite. I hope we just go over there quickly. There's a bunch of stuff here that goes into it. This is the base on, on top of which the standalone uh, Uber jar is built. Uh, this is fairly complete in itself, but it doesn't start up by itself. You, you'd still have to have a project in which you would pull in the uh, site pay library and sort of set some things up about how to run it. And that's kind of described over here. There's a whole set of new documentation that needs to be done and kind of an outline of stuff that needs to be all fleshed out. But, uh, it's just a matter of time. And then, uh, yeah, mostly a, mostly a time issue. So let's go back. Actually, let me close this. Close that out. And over here, this is the most likely and most and the easiest way to, to start using this thing. It's, it's literally as it says down here, site they delivered it as self-installing uh, and running Uber job. So this is how you can get it. Um, or, you know, usually use, let me get a link to this actually. Uh, Wget or curl or or whatever else your favorite tool is to grab stuff off the web. Um, it used to be that it, it only ran in JDK eight, but now it's uh, JDK eleven plus operable. Uh, it's been certainly tested on eleven and seventeen, which are the LTS versions. Um, I haven't actually tried sixteen. Um, Chris Nuremberg actually mentioned that 16 is kind of deprecated because it has binary incompatibilities with 17. So it's not a great thing to, to use anyway, now that 17 is out. But this is it. You just Java minus jar, have you download the thing, minus minus install is the switch. That's it. And it should sort of grind away for a bit. On an installation, it will also download the necessary MKL libraries that Neanderthal and Deep Diamond need and set, uh, set those up. The, um, and it's all inside of this tilde dasyke home directory, if you will, that gets created during the installation. But if you already have an installed thing, you can just update. Instead of like removing the whole thing and trying to just start over again, you can just do an update. And then uh, also provided our scripts for Linux, Mac, and now Windows uh, for running the thing. This is probably, it's kind of the simplest way to do it. They're, they're fairly simple scripts too, but, and you can take a look at them. You might want to change them or fool around with them, or whatever. Uh, when, uh, in both the Linux and Mac, the scripts set up the paths to, directly use the MKL library. So Neanderthal is directly, immediately usable. Um, on Windows, there's still, uh, I, I, actually there's an issue about this on Windows over here. Auto finding MKL on Windows. If anybody knows how to do that, it would be really nice if somebody were to comment in there about how to do it. Because at the moment, I don't quite know how to set up the pass automatically in the scripts. So the Windows scripts don't do that. And if you try to work with Neanderthal, chances are, unless you have the MKL libraries already installed in a kind of system-wide location, chances are really good that it won't run. 
Um, but anyways, there it is. So let me get out of that. Ah, so, okay, installation example. Let's try this. So what I have over here is a, uh, just a test user. And I don't have any .sit directory. It's not installed. So let me just see if I can get this to work by grabbing the thing. Let me, let me make this the whole screen. So there we are. If you got a decent link, it should be pretty quick. It's like, yeah, it's in the 67 megabytes. In this day and age, I guess it's actually kind of small, but anyways, there it is. Um, so there it is. So we'll just do our minus jar. And and we'll give it the minus minus install. And with it, of course, in live demos, who knows, but with a little bit of luck, it'll just work. Yeah, it's a good idea to always do this. I, it, originally, I, I thought it made sense to put this stuff in different places, but that, it's, that turned out to be kind of a bad idea. So, and then some of this logging stuff, is no longer pertinent. When I was debugging things, it was kind of nice to have all that stuff be printed out. I should probably change that. So here it is. It's actually installing the MTL libraries. Uh, again, if you have a decent link, it'll take, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds or something like that. But once that's done, uh, you will have a fully available. Oh, that was, that was, uh, that was pretty good. So. Now we do have our dot side tag. So if we go in there, there's all our stuff. There's all the inhale stuff. And if we take a quick look at sick and the Mac. So that, that this this script is as is as is written up in the um, documentation is, uh, is for JDK 8. If you're using JDK 9 plus, there's a bunch of other switches. Uh, we can actually look at that. That are necessary to make uh, Neanderthal work. So there's different things that need to be done in order to make that actually work. It's not significantly different, but it's, there it is. And it defaults to port 3000. This REPL port, I never use. Most people here, probably, if, if they have more modern <laughs> or up-to-date uh, CIDR kinds of um, in their, in their uh, tools, uh, this may not even work. Um, I tend to not update my tool set too frequently, mostly because it's so painful to do, which I guess is sort of another reason why I kind of use this site a lot. I actually use it in my day-to-day -day work more than I do Emacs and CIDR anymore. Okay, so let me stop sharing the whole desktop and then I will just share uh, this window, which with a little bit of luck will be all we need for the rest of the presentation. All right. So we did this installation configuration. We yeah, could have looked at that, but we can look at the default one. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can configure. There's different sections. Uh, you can have the thing evaluate, evaluate code on load of a page. We're not going to really talk about any of this today. It's too much, too involved for that. Um, there are, we're going to talk more about this, but there's other editors other than Emacs. There's other modes other than closure. And there's a whole bunch of themes. Um, and then you can set up 
the structure of not so much the structure, but the size of different things. And we'll see that. Then there's all these key bindings. These are a bunch of extra key bindings. Um, some of these people will disagree with. If Mark was here, he would say, yeah, I totally disagree with control F being forward S expression. Um, yeah, and then there's a bunch of other stuff in terms of also the size and various, the maximum size of areas and stuff. There you go. Um, so there's a lot you can configure. Um, okay, so on to the next. Let's talk about general capabilities. As I sort of mentioned, I didn't want, I wanted something where you didn't have to go through all the formal ceremonies of setting things up like uh, entire projects and this, that, and the next thing. So this has strong dynamic dependencies built in. So you don't really need to set up an entire project or anything before you just dive in and start fooling around. Um, it's also, it's really nice for dynamic data exploration. We can, uh, we'll take a quick look at that. It's uh, very nice for doing interactive documents. And we'll take a quick look at one of those. And also pretty cool for doing full board, client, server dashboards. Uh, and we'll take a look at one of these things. These two are actually stuff that was done specifically for a couple of the labs. Uh, this is just a thing that uh, I, I sort of crib. I, what I did is uh, uh, Daniel gave a presentation involving this thing um, uh, with respect to uh, tablecloth and TMD. And I just sort of cribbed it into Cite. Uh, so let's take a look at these. Let's take a look at this one first. Um, and, oh, actually, this is maybe worth noting too is, so I have uh, three of these host 3100. So I'm not using the 3000, which is the default. The main reason I don't do it is because if I'm doing development stuff, I get, everything gets all gummed up with the production version versus the other one. And so I usually run um, the production version on 3100. Um, so there's, there's several of these things. Um, it almost looks like maybe, okay. Looks like it didn't actually load this yet. So uh, you'll see an example of loading these things. Uh, if I can figure out where it is. Maybe we got to actually use, uh, let's try this again. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, so these different 3100s are just set up on different pages. So this is the presentation. This is gonna be where we do some live coding stuff. And this, this is this first example of kind of data exploration stuff. So you can just do these dynamic dependencies. There's a thing called depths. The other thing is, is a lot of this, all these, um, Things like depths and stuff are directly visible as soon as you fire the thing up. It's, those things are are automatically included into the various namespaces. And we'll talk a bit more about that. But every tab can have a separate namespace or we can use the same namespace. So you can just run this depth. Actually, it's already been done. So this would be very, very quick. Um, and then the I think I've already compiled everything too. So it's all done. Um, and we'll talk about how I'm executing all these forms and stuff, but that's pretty much it. Um, let's actually, uh, instead of counting the rows, let's just take a little quick look at. So this will grind away for a little bit here, and then paint, paint the, paint the screen. Uh, yeah, that's a little better. You can resize these things, these windows and stuff. Uh, and you can scroll around in here. 
So you can see those, it's, it's pretty nice in terms of being able to quickly see via TMD yeah, in this particular case. But you, you, know, you, can, you can do these nice things and you can also pull the screen over if you wanna see more of that, you know, unless of the editor and whatnot. So all this has sort of been already run in a way and here's an example where you can do some visualization stuff. This is, again, it's um, not exactly something which, uh, let's see here. Yeah. And again, you can sort of pull this over. And, now you can sort of scroll around in this thing and look at And all this is doing, it's, it's very, very, this is nothing really. It's not doing much of anything. It's just randomly sampling. Oops. The Mac, the Mac, the Mac got me. It's just randomly sampling the, um, the data set and painting pictures. That's all it's doing. Don't you hate oh. when that scroll left uh, moves to the previous page? <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Yeah, I, I hate I mean, actually at the point where I scroll right. kind of loathe Swipe. the Macintosh. But uh, at any rate, yeah, so that's the basic idea. So that's, and, and you can just do a lot of much more ex exploratory kind of stuff going around like that. Um, so let's go back here. Now we're gonna talk about an example of an interactive document using what well, was a, an experiment doing, um, using a artificial selection technique to create new tRNA amplicons. So what happened is there was a whole bunch of data that was generated by one of the labs. And then we had to sort of break it down and analyze it in terms of which of the sequences got amplified and which didn't. And so, the, I wrote up the results of all that in this nice little document here. So you can see how you can split, you can have columns on both, on each side and you can set things up. You can use LaTeX like down here, um, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And then included with that, you can have charts and they're all kind of live and you have different information in, in them. People can then move around and this is sort of look at all these things and sort of read through this and see how this stuff maps down to the results down here and whatnot. And actually the paper for this thing is just about ready to come out. So that's, but there you go. I mean, you can get real nice formatting. You can do all kinds of stuff with this. Pretty nice. Then you have, uh, here's a, an example of a, Pretty hardcore client server dashboard. And over here, take a look at look at this thing. What this does, it does a couple of different things. In particular, these first charts are kind of handy in terms of telling. Like, so you you have a bunch of reads, and you want to know whether you know which ones are actually mapped to the genome, and then which ones of those are actually assigned to a particular kind of gene. And uh, in particular, one of the things that people really want to sort of know about is whether or not um, uh, the rRNA is a small part because there's big, um, scientists, biologists really go to a lot of effort to get, try and um, re, uh, suppress, suppress the rRNA. Um, expression in their data sets because it would just completely dominate everything if he didn't. And so that's, this, that's one of the things this, this can do. And it, but you can select different ones. I mean, mice are always sort of interesting because they're, well, as you, actually this is an example. So, so we'll, we'll see here, there's, there's very little, there's very little of this stuff being expressed down here. Um, but with mice, one of the other things that happens with this dashboard is you'll get, there's a lot more data and a lot more, there's 218 million reads in this thing. So there, that's a lot. So when I click this go, all the computation for the data sets is being done over on our servers. 
and we have some fairly decent servers. This this particular thing is running on a 64 core, um, 256 gigabyte server. So it's got a decent amount of oomph to it. And uh, you will see here that these things magically appear dynamically as well. So with eukaryotes like mice, you, you have chromosomes. And so you kind of look at the chromos, the actual gene type counts per chromosome and the total gene uh, coding sequence uh, reads per chromosome, that kind of stuff is hard to enter. And then these are the other genes, things like the tRNA and mRNA, miscellaneous RNA, non-coding RNA and all that stuff. So there's a lot of junk in here. And you can scroll around in this and then you can actually take snapshots and save them out to external CSV things. And as you can see, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff to this, including database access and other things. So, um, yeah, but for the user, all they got to do is come over and just click stuff and then give it the go and you know, get the, the updated data sets and whatnot. So there you go. Uh, pretty nice. Uh, okay, so that's enough of that. So now let's talk a little bit about how this all kind of works. Um, in particular, let's start with the editors. So the editors that are available are Emacs, Vim, and Sublime. And I have tried Vim a bit. Actually, Michael helped me with Vim once quite a while ago and sort of verified that it seemed to do Vim-like things. <laughs> Um, I've never really tried Sublime. It would be great if somebody who knows Sublime would, would, would help out with this. Uh, um, but the key thing here is that they're all code mirror implementations and code mirror is written in JavaScript. And because of that, the editors are directly pro pro programmable uh, with ClojureScript. That really enables, that enables a lot of stuff that makes this thing um, be able to do what it does. In particular, you can now do direct structural editing and code transformations right with the editor. So uh, there's no need for macros. And in particular, this thing being um, in self-hosted closure script, macros don't work so great in self-hosted closure script anyway. Uh, there are different uh, ideas or different uh, uh, mechanisms through, through which you should be able to use macros. Um, I tried using these things myself. Um, it's sort of doable, but it's kind of clumsy. And it's um, kind of also where you constantly have to keep rebuilding things in order for the macros to be visible and available. However, since, it, since this is the case, you don't need any of that anyways because you have direct access to the text, which you can then just turn into closure data structures. And as soon as you have that, you have all of the capabilities of closure and closure script to manipulate those data structures and transform them however you want. And so in some ways, it's actually much more versatile than macros because you have a wide range of scopes. You, you don't just have individual forms like a macro. You can have groups of forms, groups of forms that span um, several different high level, I mean, uh, you know, you know, top level, top level forms. You can have an entire buffer. You can look at an entire buffer and then start uh, doing copy, uh, structural computations and transformations on, on the data that's available from the entire buffer. So you have enormous amounts of capability here. And uh, as an aside, is I think this is one of the reasons back in the old days, there was a lot of talk in the common list community about always wanting to rebuild Emacs in common list so that you could do these sorts of things directly in the language. So you, you, we just have this immense kind of capability, if you will. Um, now, I mean, this is a smaller scale of 
what you could probably do if you, you know, rewrote Emacs and Clojure or something. I, you know, I don't even know if that makes any sense. Um, but back in the day, well, actually, there were, back in the day, there was this thing called Hemlock, which was sort of a, and it, it never really got traction, but it was something, I, I believe it was a kind of variation of Emacs written in some common list. Anyways, key point here is because of this, you can do a lot of magic that, that is very difficult to do if you don't have this available to you. All right, key bindings. Uh, there's a large range of customizable key bindings. There's default actions for base editors. So like the Emacs author, the author of the Emacs variant in Code Mirror provides pretty much most of the kind of default keys that you would expect if you're an Emacs user. The same is true of Vim and Sublime, though I'm less, I don't really know much of anything about Sublime, so I don't know how, tr how close to reality that is, but the Vim thing seems to be, to the limited extent that I know anything about it, it seems to work in that same fashion. Then there are also paretic functions that are available and you can bind these however you want. And then there are Cite functions that are available. And you can see all of this stuff out on the uh, GitHub here for Cite and the docs, standard key maps. And this kind of goes through the things that are, that are available. And, the, and this also gives you the standard, well, the default key bindings. So, some of this stuff we've already sort of seen inside of the uh, config.eden. Um, but base Emacs is there. Um, control W doesn't act, uh, this, is, this is a very important thing though. Because we're in browser land, the browsers can screw things up. So like in particular, even though control W, <laughs> the author has control W bound to kill region, just like standard Emacs. Um, it won't work because the browser will intercept that and, and and there's no way in Chrome, Mozilla, it doesn't seem to make any difference. They all intercept control W and use it as change to a new window. I mean, it's kind of a crazy thing. And it's, if you look this up, it, it turns out it, the, some of these things like control C is another one are literally hard coded in, in the browsers. Yeah, there's no way to configure this to get rid of this crazy behavior. Uh, so there's some limits on what you can do in terms of what keys you can actually bind. Um, right. So, but these are all the functions that are available. Anything with an EM in front of it is Emacs. Um, again, if we could make anything with a BI in front of it, say, uh, available and anything with an SV or something like that in front of it for Sublime. Um, but again, I don't know enough about those right now to actually support them directly. So anybody knows anything about that stuff would be pretty cool if there was some help for it. Um, same thing with Paredit. There's a bunch of stuff available, kind of standard slurp, barf, you know, kill, ex kill ex expression this, that, and the next thing. Yeah, the, the kind of the usual stuff. Those things are directly available. Uh, I have to get rid of the zoom bar. Um, oh, okay. Yep, yep. Um, that's that. Okay, so let me get out of this. And let's go and look at keys and, and here we're just going to talk about the site keys. So, so over here like I said there's all these different functions that are available but this one here is the one that people won't be familiar with to any extent. So these are all things that are provided by site itself. So there's the ability to show documentation on both the JVM and the JavaScript side. Uh, you can show the source, you can do hinting, uh, and um, 
I don't know if people would prefer this or not, but personally, I kind of like um, on demand kind of hinting. So F9 gives you the JVM and control F9 gives you the JS. There is a, um, a configuration parameter that you can then set to true and have um, hint on key up. So you get the standard kind of every time you touch a key, you get a set of completions and whatnot. That kind of drives me crazy, but if you like that kind of thing, you can set that to be true. Um, then there's this execution kind of stuff. So there's control X, control E, evaluate last X, best expression, just like CIDR. Control X, control C, evaluate outer S expression, just like CIDR. Both of these are done are for the JavaScript side, so that's on the client. And then there's a control XJ for doing the same kind of thing for the JVM, uh, for the last X expression and control X, control J to do the outer X expression on JVM. And then there's control X, control M to do this mixed stuff. And we're gonna talk more about that in this next section here, about what all this means and all that. And, and as it turns out, I often typically have control X, control C bound to the same function as the control X, control M. It just seems a little bit handier to me. Um, okay, and then there's frame editing and visualization. So there's shortcuts for creating all these frame um, skeletons or um, wireframes, if you will. They, they, they basically give you the starting structure to then just start typing away, you know, so you don't have to remember all kinds of gobbledygook uh, to actually get going. So you, uh, again, you can just bind these how you want, but I have them as control T will insert a shortcut for text only frames uh, and control alt V for visual frames. And then you can do snippets of stuff. Control C to insert um, a piece that gives you the ability to show code mirror editors in your document body. And then Control Alt M to do markdown elements in general. And then this Control Alt backslash for LaTeX. And you can get a bunch of default things as well. Uh, you can. Control-Alt-D will insert a form that will let you configure a bunch of different markdown defaults for your tab. And those will be specific to each tab if you uh, set that up. Uh, and we'll, we're gonna actually see this stuff in action um, when we do some of the more live stuff. So insert and delete frames. So, the, so this is this frame idea is directly from Hanami, and it's been discussed in many other places. But as a short, quick review, everything in this document body over here, we're in a document body here, and we're actually in a document body here. And if we, and we could open, we're going to say a little bit more about this, but we can open up. Here's the editor that was used to create all this stuff. And then we can just close this back up. Um, but then how do you get these things inserted? Well, Control X, Control I will insert one of these picture frames. And a picture frame has a top, right, bottom, left frame element. And in the middle can be a visualization or it can be empty if you're just doing text. So this Control Alt T thing we'll just do a text and the control B will paint you a picture frame or will start you with a picture frame uh, skeleton in the editor, in the editor over here, so that you can, um, uh, would have a visualization in the middle. Inserts this a synonym, control X, control D, deletes the thing and deletes this a synonym. Um, there's a bunch of others. It's always possible to come over here, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this, but you, there's always this quick help. If you can't remember something, you can come over here, and a lot of the standard things are just listed here. 
Okay, so code execution. Code execution. There's three forms. We sort of mentioned this. One is you run a form in the JavaScript engine. And then when you do that, it's a synchronous operation. There's, um, so there's no async callback kind of stuff directly supported. It's if you execute that form, it's synchronous. Um, then there's the run the form on the JVM. This is inherently asynchronous because there's no way, I mean, there's, uh, you're sending a message over to the JVM and uh, somehow it has to send something back. And so that's an asynchronous operation. You can run multiple, because of that, you can actually run multiple JVM um, executions at once. Sometimes that makes sense. As it turns out, in practice, I found that this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Every once in a while, it makes sense where you can run a different form in a different tab. So you have different results coming back to different tabs. But in general, I find this to be interesting, but not overly useful. Um, and then there's this mixed code mode. And running in mixed mode is a situation where you're gonna be running Client side closure script slash JavaScript and intermix with calls out to the JVM. And the client controls the flow. So the intermix execution appears synchronous. Okay, so you may have a, you know let binding with some JavaScript, I mean, or I mean some closure script that followed with uh, uh, a call out to the JVM followed by some more stuff. And, and so you'll have intermixed things going on there, um, but the flow appears synchronous and it's implemented via rewriting the promise chains. And this rewriting the promise chain stuff is a direct result of this stuff. So that's, that's how that works. It's, it's, it takes the form in the editor, um, transforms it into closure data structures, and then does a bunch of stuff in order to rewrite it as a promise chain. So anytime you do this calls over to the JVM, what's happening here, so you got kind of a picture, you got an editor with its output buffer over on this side and you're asking, run this over on the JVM and JVM's over here in the server and that's done via a message. So all this stuff is layered on top of a message service called Hanasu, which um, is a extensible, very simple actually, but very extensible messaging capability. It's layered on top of WebSockets. And in this particular case, um, Site has this thing called a bell CLJ and it sends that over to the server. When the server gets done with it, it sends a message back called with a eval res op type. And here as an example is eval message implemented in the server. This is the code. So there's not a whole lot of code to make this magic work. And this, this thing is used for all kinds of stuff. It's not just used for running a computation, it's, it's also used for hinting and documentation. And, 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 and I can't even think of all the different things it's used for, but that's, it's all done via this one entry point. And that's sort of, that's, that's how that is. All right, control panel. Control panel, we're just gonna go through this pretty quick here. Um, yeah, so there's this logo, and that's configurable. You can have a different image and whatnot over here. There's this session marker. And session, originally session made a kind of sense as a name because it was a publish subscribe kind of thing. I find that as turned out in practice to not be overly useful or sometimes it can actually get in the way. Um, so this probably ought to be like folder or something, but right now it's still called session. 
and underneath session there's different files and stuff that you can that you can invoke and then the different the, that name will change based on where you're at uh, there's an application spinner which we've already seen will we'll, it will we'll run here when you're loading a new document that has a bunch of preset um, execution markers in the buffers we're not going to get into that today it's too complicated but you can effectively have chunks of your buffer run as closure chunks run as closure script chunks run as mixed and have that automatically happen when you load up one of these things um, yeah the load and save group so there's document upload and document save and then there's just re regular load a code file and save a code file. These these code file things are basically exactly like and you know uh, load you know control X control F Emacs kind of a thing and control X control S. It's literally that. It's a buffer on a, on a file. Um, those things can be handy because uh, there's a set of scratch I mean there's a set of things that come with it I don't think scratch is one of them but like TMD what like if you want the automatic depth stuff you can grab a file that has all of those depths and requires and stuff already in there and so you can then just run the thing so you can insert that in your buffer and then just run them so there's some handy things with being able to do these simple code like things Tab manipulation group. Uh, well, actually, no. The editor visibility thing. We already seen that. We've already seen that. So that's this stuff. And uh, if you pull this over more, you'll see some other stuff. Actually, this is an. This will clear your output buffer. This will rerun. If you had markers in here, it would rerun the code. Um, and then you can just close that up for the uh, published version of the document. Uh, tab manipulation group. So. There's all the usual kind of stuff. Add, you can duplicate. Uh, there's this thing where you can, if you have a boatload of frames, sometimes it's nice to be able to come in here and select things that you want to delete um, in a kind of batch process. There's um, undo the last tab, like if you delete a tab and you want to undelete it or redo. Um, uh, there's moving. This is pretty handy. So if you're if like right now, we got control panel. I can move it to the left. So it'll now show up over there and I move it back to where it was, move them around. There's edit. Uh, in here, there's different things you can do. You can reset the sizes of the editors and output areas. And then you can change the body here. The body is laid out in row order. So you can have a frame here and another frame here, or if it's a you know frame here and then you know the, the next one is underneath. You can specify the number of elements. So right now it's a row order, one element per row. So it's just going to be a linear top to bottom flow. If you put, made this two or three, you would do one, two, three. And then one, the next, you know, four, five, and six in the next row, that kind of stuff. Or you can change it to column, where you're doing the columns instead. Um, yeah, you, you can change the name of these things. And maybe one of the most important things in here is you can change the namespace associated with uh, the tab. So every tab has an associated namespace. So if you don't want every one of these things to have the same namespace, you can change that. And that can be useful because one idea, one way in which it could be useful, suppose you have, if you're doing feature exploration or something and, 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 and you have a tab and a bunch of code and you have a set of features that you're playing with, uh, but you want to change the set a bit and look at how it works out, without having to rewrite all the code or rename all the code, different names and stuff, you can just duplicate the tab, change the namespace, change the features you're, you want, and then just rerun the thing in, in that different namespace. Um, what else? Oh yeah, delete. Delete just deletes it, just what you would think. 
Then there's this information group. There's uh, themes. So you got a whole bunch of themes um, or you can just change the, and th these themes are for the editors. So um, actually let's just do a quick example of that. Let's open this editor. Here we are back with this thing. It's Zenburn because I kind of like Zenburn. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, people like Solarized Light, I think is a kind of a popular one. Uh, so now you got that. Um, right. Uh, go back to, let's go back to the Zenburn here. Anyway, so you can do that kind of stuff, that themey, themey kind of thing. We don't like the color that comes with it. Yeah, I, we've already seen this handy thing that can pop up if you can't quite remember something. And then there's this doc help, which right now is a no-op. So that's another piece of work that needs to be done. Okay, so on the tabs. We've seen a little bit of this. Um, the basic idea of tabs in general, and this comes from Hanami really, is that they're used for organizing things. That's one of their primary purposes. So you can organize templates and widgets, code, the different presentations, like, you know, whether you're, you're like here, you have this, and, and maybe you know, here, 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 here's the database, you know, here's all the stuff associated with interacting with the database. And there's SQL and there's all the main code and, and then the data sets involved and how they, all that stuff. And then you have, in this particular case, you just have the one, but you could have more than one of these things. Um, right, and so, so, and then they go, yeah, overall document dashboard. So we just took a quick look at that. Um, you already talked about this. You have names associated with them. The other thing is, yeah, there's a lot of this batteries included stuff where a lot of things are automatically required and in particular, things that uh, um, enable you to directly use all the Cite capabilities. So you don't have to remember to require something or this or that or whatever. Um, also names that are, are, are synced between JBM and JS. So right now I'm, I'm still in this doc.code, but there's a doc.code now over on the JBM side. And uh, I can then sync variables and stuff between the two. Um, yeah, so there's two basic types that Cite provides. One is the editor with output pane. We haven't actually seen one of those yet, but we're going to do some of that. And here, here's an example. We're going to do some live coding over here. Um, so here's, here's the editor over on the left, and then the output is over on the right. So that's one form. And that's usually used for coding coding stuff up in data exploration, kind of like what we saw when we were fooling around with this over in this side, where um, it's too bad I got rid of that. Let's do it again here. Yeah, where you have, oh, I forgot, I forgot I had to reload this thing and then I screwed that up. Yeah, anyway, so you get the, uh, the output over here and you can sort of look at it and whatnot. Uh, then you have editor with document body or frame canvas. You know, think of it as a canvas or a document body that you're going to paint things into. This is where you give the interactive presentations like this. Um, dashboards like this, um, and you can close up the associated editor panel, which we've already seen, and like over here, there's all this stuff in here that is how this stuff is all laid out and whatnot. Uh, and yeah, in a way, these things are typically the main event. Um, I mean, certainly it's the case over here, Biologists, they don't care about any of this stuff. This is what they're interested in. 
this picture, you know, these pictures and the ability to manipulate them and whatnot. All right, so examples. Let's do some example stuff. Kind of that'll be our wrap up. So first of all, let's take a look at a couple of things here. So let's run this. We're gonna run this on the JavaScript side with control X, control E, and then we'll run it on the JVM. So if we come over and put the cursor over on the rightmost heron, and we do a control X, control E, nothing interesting, we're unexpected, but we do a control X, J, you'll, you might have saw or right here, just underneath this rerun thing, a quick blip for a spinner, which indicates that it's running on the JVM. So I'll do it again if you watch there. There you go. So yeah, same results, not a, unexpected. Um, so let's do a different thing. We're going to run this big computation <laughs> with totally fake, goofy thing of inking 10 million um, integers. Oh, we got a chat here. What is this? Literally too fast, I think, to show in the screen share. Uh, that's depend. Yes, but that depends. As you will see in this example right now, that's no longer true. <laughs> because this Mac doesn't have much in the way of cores. If I was running this on one of the uh, one of the um, lab servers, this would be much much quicker. But because it, it you know you got sixty four cores that you can split this across and crank over, but I only have like two real cores in this thing, four virtual threads or whatever. Um, but we're still going to fold. So we're going to run it. We're going to beat up the processors on the server. And then random sample from it. And then we're going to effectively assign or bind it over on the client to this symbol foo. So let's run this. And we have to run this as mixed code because we have a tag. This tag is CLJ. Yeah, actually, let's do that. If I, if I run this, if I try to run this on the JavaScript with control X, control E, you're going to get an error because it can't find, doesn't know what this CLJ thing is. And if you try to do the same thing over on the, on the JVM, you're going to get the same kind of error. Unable to resolve symbol CLJ in this context, which is true because that doesn't exist anywhere. It's not a macro. It's just a tag saying that this thing, the stuff inside of me, is to be run on the JVM. That's that's all it's saying. So let's run this with for real. Now you see the spinner cranking away because uh, it's trying to ink ten million hints. <laughs> uh, and now we have our foo. But that foo, if I put my cursor next to that foo, I actually let's come down here. Run on JS and try on JVM, right. So if I put my cursor next to that foo and do a control X J, I'm still gonna get the unbound. Doesn't know what this is. Um, if I try to count it on the JVM, it's gonna give me this error, you know, unbound. Okay, so, but if I'm on the JavaScript side, I, let, let's not actually do that because it's maybe kind of big. If I do control X, control E here on the count. Okay, so there's 10,000 of these things. And then I can take on the JavaScript side, I can take 10 of these. There we go. Um, but if I tried to do that on the JVM with the control X, J, it's gonna give me, nope, can't do it because it's on about. All right, now this is a little more interesting as an example of mixed code mode, this, this sample down here. So what this is doing is we're gonna bind X to one in, in ClojureScript, 
on the JS side. And then we're going to execute this system property thing. <laughs> this was actually Mark Hampton's suggestion because it's like, no, this is impossible to do on the JS side. It's not, maybe, maybe you'd never want to do it anyway. But anyways, okay, we're going to execute this thing over on the uh, JVM and bind the result to on the client side. So this Y is on the client side. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna show X, and then Y, and then we're gonna count Y, and then we're gonna add X to the count of Y. So we execute this thing, there you go. But it has to run synchronously, Otherwise, we're going to get undefined stuff happening here when we try to add X to Y, because even though it looks pretty lightning quick, you saw that spinner here for a blip of a second or two, and the JS code would run super fast, and you would get undefined. Um, we can actually look at this. Let's take a quick look at what happens. There's one of the, there's a key, control X, X. This is mostly for me. I don't think most people would pay much. Well, if you're a developer and you're interested, maybe it's useful. Where we can see how this thing is rewritten. So this is what this let binding and body turn into. This is what it really is. And so you can see that the, the Y here ends up being the, um, the finishing of the promise and it's passed in as the argument to the finishing function and the promise. And then the rest of this stuff happens. So all that rewriting is being done because the form actually gets turned into closure script list of things, just, you know, so literally that's what it is, right? It's a list of symbol and a vector and all this stuff. And then it's all cranked and manipulated to turn it into this sort of thing. Okay. Now let's do another kind of, um, we'll, do, we'll, we'll just add an interactive tab. So we can add this interactive doc stuff, or we can add one of these editor output things. So let's just add the interactive doc thing. Um, I don't know, let's call it something else. Live, whatever. So there we go. So now we have one of those editors and we have the body over here. And let's, this time, let's paint a few things. So to start, let's do a control alt V and it puts this skeleton in place. So we do a control X, control I it'll immediately paint this picture. So because it's got some dummy data in here. It says change to your data source and then you can change it, you know, change it, it basically, it's, it's your starting, starting point. It does a quick starting point thing. Um, we can, uh, oh yeah, okay. So we can, we can also add some stuff here. We got that control alt M we should put markdown directly in place so you can do, um, I don't know, title. So it puts the title in the top frame because that's what we started with over here. It's in the top. But I actually think we can do something a little more interesting than that. Let's do this control alt backslash. So now we have our LaTeX frame, a schema, if you will. And let's just, just do that. Control X, Control I to refresh it, and there we go. All right. So let's do another one. Actually, we'll do a few more of these because we're going to be able to show something here. So let's kill that. Um, uh, let's, yeah, let's change this to uh, math. Actually, let's even do a, let's do one of these completions here, a hint or whatever. 
And put our eye back there. Let's square this. And now we have, let's go range. And actually, one of the things, this is an interesting thing I found. This is kind of a toxic interaction with JavaScript and closure message pack. Actually, that's maybe it's sort of worth mentioning. It's the messaging that goes back and forth between the client and the server is on top of this Hanasu, and Hanasu uses as its default closure message pack. And um, JavaScript interprets anything that doesn't have something after the decimal point as an integer. And so in particular, if you give it a negative number, it'll go over as a negative integer, but the message pack gets confused about that. And well, if it's too small or if it's negative, it's too large, it'll interpret that as a, actually it'll encode it into a positive byte, which is a bug in closure message pack, which we have to uh, ping the authors about. But at any rate, uh, let's paint this thing. Control X, Control I. So there we got our next thing here. Um, actually, the only reason that makes a difference is if you save this document. Actually, let's do this. Let's, let's do that. Um, so let's put another one of these things in here. Well, actually, let's, let's put this. We might, might as well do this again, too. Um, And you can sort of see that the Watek also is um, obeys the uh, the markdown uh, in terms of the font size and stuff. So we do that. For, so for example, if we if we only had one hash, it's going to be jumbo. But it but it does it, it obeys the markdown sizing. So let's do a as a another example. Qubit. We'll do a minus minus fifty to fifty. Now this is actually gonna look correct, but if we ended up saving it, it would come back messed up because of that byte negative integer crazy situation. So let's paint it though. Oh, I did the wrong thing. I just execute I just I didn't actually paint, I just executed it and got the results down here, which yeah, you can sort of see, but not very interesting. It's just a bunch of numbers. Um, so let's uh, clear that, get rid of that, and then actually paint this thing, control X, control I. So everything right now is in this. So if we, um, pull this over a little bit. So, Right now we're in this rower, but it's one. Uh, so let's change that to two. And you'll see that what is, okay. So this is interesting as well. Okay, so now we have, the, notice this is jumbo. That's because we have this 800 over here, which is a default, which works pretty nicely if you're doing top to bottom linear stuff, but it doesn't work so great if you're doing this sort of thing. So that makes it a little bit nicer. And in fact, um, we have this 800 down here too, which is a mess. Um, uh, but you say, well, I don't want to keep remembering all that stuff. So it's, you, you can set these defaults. So we do our, this is that thing I mentioned before, we'll set up these markdown tab specific defaults. 
And so there's this 800 here. Maybe we, we can just change that. We'll just change that. And um, so now, so now when we do our, when we do our markdown, so let's add another one of these things. You'll see now that it's 80. This is 80 now, so. Actually, yeah. Yeah, when you uh, change that, what's, uh, what do you do to bring it in the settings? And also, is it local to this editor or is it more global? It's it's local to the uh, editor in this tab. So if we went to a new tab, this eighty this wouldn't the, it maybe changed a bunch of these things up in here. Um, if we went to a new tab, those things would not be associated with that tab unless you reran the same defaults over on that side. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then you had some sort of keystroke magic to bring it in. Yes, that was uh, actually. Let's let's go back to keys. Yeah. Well, it's not uh, my. Point yeah. was that it it's, was it's worth talking about because it, it's right here. It's this uh, control alt D insert shortcut for MD defaults. So we've used oh. control alt T. Actually, maybe we haven't used that, but we've definitely used this one. That's the visualization frame. Uh, we haven't done this one yet. Um, we did this to insert the markdown element. That's where that 800 and then it got changed to 80 width is. And then we did this to get the LaTeX. And we did this in order to get a starting thing for the, oops, probably should stay over here just in case. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and, okay, and then, actually let's do one more because now we got the 80 there. Let's, um, we're about done here, but let's just put one, yeah, let's just do this then as well. Um, uh, I think I did something wrong here. Let me back up. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, I was trying to insert on top of an insert. All right, so let's repaint that. But the key thing is, is that now we don't have to remember to reset that um, 800 thing, and if we Come down here. Um, let's just paint this again for the sake of argument. And uh, wow, um, is everything still okay? The Mac attacked me. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically okay. We we just don't have. It's not lining up because we don't have the uh, the the heading. We don't have a header. So. And it'll probably be kind of enough to, to move the thing down. Yeah, actually, let's give it the uh, yeah. There you go. So that and, and um, let's close this. So now we have something here. Um, maybe you wanted to do. Maybe this should be three. And then, we'll, yeah, I forgot to reset this one. <laughs> uh, okay. But at any rate, so I think that's kind of, um, I think I'm kind of done. Uh, separate questions and whatnot. Did you want to save it or not? 
Oh, actually, let's, uh, yeah, because I had that, I, I wanted to point out that bug. See, so one of these will work, but this, the cube, the cubic won't work. Right? So let's go back to just two. And then there, there you go. So this, this thing, actually, this thing will come back a bit messed up because of that goofy, because we, because we didn't put a dot, we didn't actually put anything after the decimal point. So it thinks it's an integer and then the uh, message pack encoder gets it wrong. But anyway, let's just save this someplace. Um, like that. All right, so in theory, we saved this thing. Let's see, uh, let's reload. And uh, we were in explore, oh, there it is. So we pull this back, ah, there you go. But you can see this is crazy. <laughs> so we can fix that by overwriting the idiocies, the toxic interaction between JavaScript and message pack. Um, let's repaint that. And now let's save it again. Okay, now let's... Um, I guess, uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's a happy camper. Um, yeah, I mean, and then you can just change these things. Let's change this to bar chart. You can get some, almost get start to get some kind of art going on here. If you change this to bar chart, you get <laughs> you get these cute. The cubic is a little nicer. So. Yeah, anyway, so yeah, you can just start fooling around with this stuff and whatever. There you go. So, so John, what's on top of your wish list for what you want to do next with this? Uh, that's kind of Uh, it's a little what you know actually what I think would be really nice is to, is to get some of the is to get stuff I, I don't know if it's the best thing but you know to get like the other editors fully supported so that people who don't know Emacs and don't like Emacs and or don't like Emacs um, will be able to use an editor that they're more familiar with and that they like that, that I think would be nice to do. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's undoubtedly a bunch of other stuff. There, there was an issue about being able to have these things, as you can sort of see, and this whole thing, let's close this up. This whole thing is in a scroller widget. It's, it's the same as what's over here. And that's why, like over here, you have these jumbo things. And they just go on and on and on. Uh, uh, but because you have it in the scroller, um, you, you, it, you, can, you can make that work. I mean, you can do this overview plus detail as well, just sort of uh, where you don't have to just scroll. You can, you can play this game. It's a little nicer. Um, but there was, at one point it was, there, there was some times when it would be cool to put these guys in the, in this frame. Okay. Here we got this picture frame where you got a top, there is a right. Actually, let's, let's do that really quick. Um, if you changed, um, let's, 
Okay, so I'm back over here in this editor. And I'm in the x squared frame. Let's, if we just change this to bottom, you'll see that, that um, and we repaint this thing. Yeah, so, so the point here is you have these top, bottom, right and left. Left in this case is just used, being used as a kind of separator buffer, but you could have text and stuff over here. Anyways, there was an idea about being able to put this picture in its own scroller so you could have jumbo pictures inside of frames as, as like jumbo frames inside of the body itself. That was, that, that's something that still might be, people have talked about that in the labs, that, that might be a, a neat thing. Uh, yeah. So, so, so you have this like a single user, I mean, you have this running locally uh, that's serving the local host 3100, right? So you, something is on the back end there, but, but you could conceivably have this running somewhere. And have you thought about having like concurrently people working on the same document and working in the same environment across, you know, against one server? Um, yes. That has turned out to be actually in this case here, I don't know if you can see, this is actually running on prints, which is over in the labs. This is, uh, so mm -hmm. this is not running on my Mac. <laughs> it would never work on the Mac. Um, so this is in fact, and, and different people can log in with different stuff. So I just happen to be um, using using Barathe's thing here. But I mean, if, if, we, if we reload this thing, um, yeah, she was just the default. I mean, I can go over here to me. I have an all mix thing. I have some meaningless stuff in here, apparently. <laughs> uh, but there are other users. And yeah, there's like DB work and there's different things. Yeah, so, and yes, it was the case um, about, well, actually, let's go over to Matt. Is there anything you have to do in order to coordinate like keep you from clobbering each other or not seeing work or, I mean. Yeah, I mean, that, that actually was the whole point of the session stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, in some ways, I'm not a hundred percent. That, that was another thing that was talked about early on, but it became less and less and less useful, or at least people have said it was, whereby um, each person would have literally like a UI user and password kind of thing. And then all of those files would be protected. You'd have to log in as them in order to change it. And it was all this stuff. Um, all of that is, a lot of the machinery to do that is still there. It's just, it just turned out that uh, it wasn't something that a lot of people cared about or wanted to, wanted to use. You just imagine in this, in this kind of remote world teams working together on something that this might be, there's a lot of collaboration capabilities being built into tools, IDEs, documents, things like that for concurrent, you know, um, work on something um, that yeah. this might be, a you know, not just a step away from that, right? Yes. I mean, you could, yes, actually that's very much true. If you, for example, um, Let's take an example. If I'm on a, yeah, if I'm over here, wait a minute. You know what? Instead of doing that, let's do this. Um, okay, so if I load up that same thing. don't have any web sockets going on here, right? Or no live connections for for pushes, right? It's all relayed. No. no, actually, actually it is. And so, okay. so if we, if we, um, I think if I do that, yeah. 
Um, what do I want here? Uh, if you change one of those and render it here, yeah. how does that affect the other concurrent user? It, it should. It should. Um, I mean, this is crazy, but let's... Well, I, I don't know. Let's... Wow, didn't actually do it. I, I was expecting it to do that. Um, but apparently what? it's hmm. not. I thought it did do that. But didn't yeah. you have to give a command shortcut to tell it to re-render re that? Uh, when you made that change? No, it was not supposed to. You know, it, it was so, yeah. It should have actually re it should have pushed it to, to because they're all because exploring is the session and and exploring is the session over here. So I mean I didn't think I turned that stuff off, but maybe I did. I'm not sure. Um, I could turn it back, but yeah. I mean it got to the point where some people were saying that was that was more confusing to them than mm -hmm. not having it. Let's put it that way. Well, it depends if these are, if your users are consumers, like they're consuming information versus they're authoring, right? Or they're yeah. elaborating on it. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. Um, so it's a big question of whether or not this is something that makes any sense for a multi-user collaborative mm -hmm. environment, or if it's more time. I mean, yeah, in the, in the, in, in the very beginning, there was a lot of thought about that, but it, as it, as it, it, as it developed, that seemed to become less and less something that meant anything to anybody. And it, it became kind of this thing was like, again, uh, not necessarily an application developer as, it, as opposed to a end user deployment thing, thing for, to deploy for end users and, and just dynamic exploratory stuff. Um, so you're right. I mean, so another possibility is, is you could have a different variation of the thing that's much more capable along the lines you're suggesting. Because a lot of the machinery to do that is, is actually in it. That's true. Um, and it probably wouldn't take a huge amount of effort to make to really flesh that out and make it pretty nice. But your users primarily don't do a whole ton of actual programming, right? That's, yep. <laughs> so, so they basically, how much programming do they do? Well, some how of How much do, of the editors do they open? Um, you'd be surprised about how, the, the, well, maybe you wouldn't. I mean, the, the, the level of sophistication is all over the place. You have people who have never written a line of code their entire life. And you have other people who are pretty savvy. You know, pretty, pretty good. Um, but you, but, but um, you, many of them, this is one of the reasons why this thing, I think, is, is much lower hanging fruit for a person like that is, is because many of them literally will use, when they're writing programs, what they use is like a notepad <laughs> or um, maybe Sublime or, or Vim. If, 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 you know, some of them are savvy enough to sort of noodle around on Unix. Uh, and that's what they use. They don't use fancy schmancy IDEs. Um, many of their programs are only like, you know, 50 to 100 lines of R or Python or something. And that's it. That, that, that's kind of it. So when I showed this to a couple of them, they were kind of excited because it was like, oh, you just fire this up and I can start noodling around immediately. 
I don't have to know how to bring in a ton of things or set up a thousand things or whatever. And, and there's not a huge amount of stuff. I mean, if you, I mean, something, I mean, something like Halva is, is a pretty neat thing if you're a software developer, but when it comes up, it's very intimidating. Have you, have you thought about porting this to like um, um, Electron that would, that would, kind of make you independent of their Chrome browser, but yet still give you the browser base to build on? Um, I'm pretty independent as it is. I mean, this thing runs, this thing will run in Mozilla or whatever. It's not a Chrome thing. Okay. Um, it, it, it's based, it, I mean, I don't know what, uh, I mean, Electron, actually under the covers for all I know, Electron would be using Code Mirror as well. I mean, I don't think anybody else is trying to. I mean, there's Code Mirror Six. Mm -hmm. Code Mirror Six is is one of these sad things in a way. It's 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 beautiful. It's way better, but unfortunately, um, it's completely non backward compatible. <laughs> so there's like in, there's I would guess. I would say, not, without hyperbole, there is probably millions of lines of code that depend on Code Mirror Five, and trying to convert that step to six is a nightmare. I mean, I've thought about it because Code Mirror Six also seems to have better performance. Um, yeah, but it's completely different. So it would be effectively, you'd have to completely rewrite all of the stuff that, um, that's, that's directly using code mirror. What do you I mean? Yeah. Uh, but in terms of portability, th this should run pretty much on any browser. I mean, you, you still have to have a Java thing someplace, someplace. Um, yeah, we can, right now this localhost stuff is on my Mac. Uh, this print stuff is is on um, one of the lab servers. So, John, can you export this to a static document like HTML? That is much. Actually, you know what? Uh, I think Tom was the one who was asking about. What, what would you like next? That is something that people have definitely asked about. It, I looked at it a little bit. I think it would be a, um, not a real hard thing to do, um, but in terms of cycles, it, it's one of those things that comes and goes. People sometimes say, hey, that would be really nice to, to have a button that says generate static HTML or something. Um, or PDF. There are people ask for PDF. That that might make even more sense in our lab setting. You can imagine if you're publishing it to lots of readers, you could use like a Jamstack approach, and then you could put it on a CDN and have a lot of people hit it and freely navigate through it. But it's all static content, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that is that is actually that would be really cool. <laughs> It would be cool. Um, it already has the ability to save all of the images in bulk. Um, I think it, there, there's, there's actually a thing that comes with it. Where is that anyway? Um, maybe it's in this. There's a lot less stuff that's in the uh, installed version, so you don't have as many of these crazy, all this junk floating. I mean, I got to clean up my own. This is becoming kind of a mess. See, I can't even find it. I don't even know where it is. It's there's. Oh, maybe it's in this. I'm in the wrong. I'm looking in the wrong place. Maybe it's in. Maybe it's in here. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, it's just an example. Yeah, this was some, 
actually this, I think, was some live data generated from a database query for something. I don't remember what. The idea was is, okay, you, uh, you, uh, where do you run this? I think this is actually on the client. So, um, right, and then we're gonna generate a bunch of, I think this is how it works. Yeah, so, okay, so now we got a bunch of stuff here. You say, well, you know, and, and um, if you gave these pictures good names, you can just save them all. So this is this visualization, thing. save all visualizations. And if we click yes, it'll just save them all. And I'll save them all inside of your .sidek directory and, and based on the test session and the name of the file, which I guess in this case was bulk save or something. And then underneath that, there would be tabs. And each tab would have all of the visualizations. So, so there would be this G counts. Yeah. So if you, do, if you do that, it should do it. I don't know. Um, but, but the point is, with respect to the discussion of, of of converting to static document, the the saving all the charts, which would be required if you're doing a PDF or something like that, or a LaTeX doc, and that's that's done. So, so the next step, I kind of looked at you know there's JV there's Java libraries for generating PDF and and HTML, which in theory should be able to incorporate those things. Yeah, so, so you don't have to go through and individually save this stuff. It's crazy, you know, you just, so you, you have that bulk save, that's pretty cool. Uh, but that's a step towards being able to do static documents. Um, oh. Yeah. So John, I have another question for you. Um, yeah. I think you mentioned that the, the documentation button is currently non-functional. What would you like to see that do? What, what sort of <laughs> documentation would you yeah. want ideally? And are you looking for collaborators and how would people- Oh God, yeah. I, I'm, I'm definitely looking for collaborators on any and all of this stuff. Um, there's a boatload of this documentation stuff that would be, yeah. You know, that's uh, not as directly available. Um, like, you know, like if you go over here, there's this, I mean, admittedly, there's, there's a lot here. I mean, it would, it, it would probably be some kind of fleshed out, more fleshed out version of what all these things do, and what you can, and, and maybe what would happen is, is what would happen is, um, is when you push this help button, it might just take you over to the, the website help page. Or, or if people have better ideas, it's, you know, I don't know what to do with that. It'd this. be nice if it could be contextualized, right? I mean, yes. see what's Absolutely. on there and take it to that. That would be very cool. Yes. That would be really nice. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then you could, and then you could add an invite and uh, advisor, you know, um, functionality that looks at your page and, and suggests things. Right, that would be cool. <laughs> that's the next level. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a very clever idea. Yeah, and it, you know what? And again, and again, because of the fact, because you know, because of this fact, that looking at the page is way more capable than you might think. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do text analysis. Actually, not only is this ability to look at, at the editors, you can look at these doc bodies. 
underneath underneath the covers, all this stuff is basically um, effectively closure script data structures as well, except for the actual biz. That's that's uh, that's one advantage of being uh, in such a data oriented environment is that data is observable, right, and can yes. be inspected. Yeah, as well as as you're rewriting stuff, even you're taking advantage of that in your rewriting, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So that exactly. So that 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 ability to do page level suggestions based on what's showing or whatever in terms of the documentation. Again, you have a very strong ability to to analyze things that is not text based. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That would that would actually yeah. That, see, that's a really cool idea. Never even occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, actually, let me do one other thing here. This is maybe a teaser for February. Somebody suggested. Yeah, I kind of like the idea. Of maybe for the next one being a soup to nut. Well, wait a minute here. I don't want to do that. I think I want to clear this thing just to make sure. Um, this doesn't work anymore because they shut down the data source I used. This works, but it doesn't mean anything for anybody here. Let's look at this. So here's that spinner up here that was spinning away. That has to do with, see the, this, these tag here, the CLJS tag? So this is, a, this is an example of where you're doing this structural editing on an entire buffer. So it's, it's looking, it reads this whole thing in as a closure data structure, and then just walks through it for each of these tags. You're gonna have sealed, this is probably just sealed, yes. Um, and it just walks through, here's one that's CLJ, and it says everything after this run on the JVM until you get to another tag, then switch over to, in this case, CLGS, then switch to mixed mode. <laughs> then, oh yeah, so maybe this isn't as organized as it ought to be because it's flipping back and forth too much. But yeah, so that's what's, that's what's going on there. Um, and what this, this example was is here's an example of, of this sort of chart using just uh, calls to the JVM um, closure. But this one over here is a little more interesting because when you move these sliders here or type in the text box, this density function is being computed in R. And the same thing with the binning, that binning is being re it computed in R. So it's an example of and he uses uh, Daniel's Clojister, which is, um, works really nice as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And this is actually a little bit of the dashboard. This is how you set up that dashboard. So, uh, and, and actually let's take a quick, yeah, open this up. That's it. This entire thing is, it's, yeah, you, it's, you have a slider input widget, text input widget, then you, the labels for those things, and you just have another one with a different data set and different data function. But anyways, the idea is, is, is uh, maybe for February is to do a full soup to nuts dashboard like this. How many of these uh, examples are available for learners to uh, to use in their learning journey? Uh, that's a good point. That's... I think everything in here is delivered in the installation. So wow. there's these. Actually, I don't know why that's in here. Um, yeah, the site overview tutorials. Um, uh, yeah, 
this COVID doesn't work anymore. I guess I should take that out. But that shiny thing we just saw, that's in there. Okay. You know, the only problem is that there is a caveat with that, and that is you have to set up the R server. You have to install R server in your R, so you, and you have to have R install. Okay, so, I mean, yeah, unfortunately the dependencies there become more convoluted. Uh, ah, you do have the Sycamutal thing. Sycamutal is pretty cool. Let's uh, there's two things in Sycamutals. Um, there's these different visuals and they got the live editor thing and then you can there's this ability to move, fool around with stuff um, so you can actually inside one of these we're in the document body here so we're not in one we're not there's all these editors are live in the document body and they're different from the main editor and, and, you, and you can just execute these things, whatever. Uh, the other one in Sycamutals that's kind of cool is the slopes thing. This was a kind of a nifty uh, thing where... <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah you remember that. <laughs> yeah, so this, that's delivered too, so. Um, there's not a whole lot to this, to be honest. The hard thing was just figuring out the Vega lights magic to make that work. Yeah, but it's kind of cool. Well, it'll be great to, uh, as a starting point, I think I'm inspired to uh, maybe create a, a little demo myself. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I did this little example using affine transforms to create a fractal leaf shape. And, oh, uh, I remember that. Yeah, right? yeah. And yeah. Uh, you, you could add a slider to it and, and have it, uh, you know, change the, oh, the right. cur curvature of the leaf or uh, the den density of the, the points. Yeah. You know, yeah, that'd yeah. be fun. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So we're coming up on two hours. <laughs> well, I guess that was way longer than I expected, but anyway. <laughs> well, there were good questions at the end and all yeah. of that. So, I would, yeah, there were some really good questions at the end. I, I, um, so, and, 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 and just... And wait a minute, and just to finish, I'm definitely always looking for any help on any of this, you know, or different ideas, you know. I, I you know, the, the PDF HTML static thing would be awesome, actually, the more I think about it. Where's a good place to contact you, uh, for, for collaborators to contact you? Uh, Zulu, the, the Sharp Site yeah. Dev uh, stream. Which is linked on the description of the meetup. Excellent. Right. Right, yes. Yeah. Very okay. nice. Fine. Yeah, very, very nice. And do we have a little bit of a teaser for next month? Yeah, I kind of, I to, well, I, that's what I was thinking was the, um, the, the uh, do a deep we dive. Do, we would do a dashboard. I mean, we would do a dashboard um, like, you wouldn't be this because, you know, you don't want to have to depend on our. Uh, you something know, but, with a bunch of features and interactivity yeah. and so on. Yeah. I mean, there's not a whole lot to this, but it does depend on our. I mean, like that, that entire thing, the entire dashboard, that's it. So there's like 90, 91 lines of code. Um, and then the chart itself is almost nothing either. It's, 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 that's it. That's how you set up this, all these widgets, they control things and everything else with the callbacks and that's it, that's the entire thing. So we could do a, a, a version of something like this, but without R so that it would just, so you don't have that dependency hell to deal with in terms of that respect. That'd be but great. I, that's what I'm thinking, unless other people have, you know, 
open to suggestions from the audience. It's like, what would they prefer for a follow-up in February? But right now, I think what we're sort of thinking is, now we have an o we had an overview about how this thing works and what you do and all that stuff. Now let's just build an example from scratch. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. So I guess people could go to, to Zulip and, and if they have, uh, they think of ideas in the interim. Yeah. They could, think, uh, yeah, it would be great. Share them there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great place to share things. Yeah. Awesome. Any final questions out there? All right. All right. Thank me. you very much. Thank you, John. Very cool. Yeah. Thank, thank everybody for attending and in the interest and so forth. <laughs> and, and actually, yeah, some of those suggestions, that was, yeah, some of those ideas were really cool. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks for uh, 